So I'm honored to give this lecture, especially when I consider the many accomplished people who've come before me. They include my former boss, my mentor and former NED board director, the late Madeleine Albright, and of course, Carl Gershman, the founding president of the endowment. The endowment was created with congressional backing about 40 years ago as an independent nonprofit grant-making foundation dedicated to strengthening democratic institutions and values around the world. But our approach is less project management, it's more talent scouting with a healthy dose of humility. We fund the most innovative and effective individuals and organizations working for democracy, often in the most challenging and dangerous places. But we don't presume to tell our partners what they should do or how they should be governed. We support their ideas. We stand with them in their struggle. Whether it's Nigeria or Russia, the future of every nation ultimately lies in the hands of its own people. Last year, we made nearly $300 million in grants to 1,500 civil society and media organizations working in 100, 100 countries. So it gives you a sense of the scale. You'll find Ned Grantees wherever democracy is at risk in the world. In Ukraine today, for example, our partners are on the front line defending freedom by documenting war crimes, countering Russian disinformation, and rebuilding civic life in liberated territories, even as they work to ensure that Ukraine emerges from this war as a stronger democracy. But today we find ourselves in a consequential moment for democracy around the world. In each of the past 17 years, the number of countries that have moved away from democracy has exceeded the number of countries that have moved towards democracy. And we can debate whether democracy is on the ropes, as some claim, or poised for a rebound, as others believe. No doubt populism and backsliding in established democracies is certainly part of the story. But there's, there's no doubt in recent years that the autocrats have taken their fight against freedom to a new and dangerous level. While sharpening their repression at home, they've embarked on a systemic, systematic and sophisticated global effort to corrupt and destabilize democracies while actively seeking to prevent democracy from taking hold. I look forward I look forward to the conversation. Welcome Jane. I, I look forward to the conversation. Yeah. Sir, I, I would I would welcome I would welcome an open conversation. The world has rejected your democracy, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. Everything you tried to do has failed, and you will be forgotten. You are a plague, and guess what? The world has super. I welcome the con I, I welcome what having the conversation anymore? tonight. There is no democracy you're promoting. You've only brought death. I am delighted to have an open conversation about these issues. You were just like Aussie Mandy, nothing will remain aside. Yeah. Now, the democracy in action, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. <laughs> yeah. Look, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about issues tonight that can be controversial. I'm going to lay out some ideas. I'm going to lay out my views. I actually welcome Feedback. I welcome challenging that. That's what healthy debate is about. Democracies, open societies that make mistakes can be self-correcting with open discussion. I also want to clarify the endowment is an independent institution. We are not the U.S. government, so I'm not here to speak for the U.S. government. Jane, you missed it, but I, want, I just gave you a shout out to welcome you. You walked in at a dramatic moment. Uh, <laughs> But Jane, I was saying, Jane Kurtzman is one of the extraordinary contributors to the endowment, and it's a real, real pleasure to have you with us tonight, especially given your circumstances. So what I was saying is that while, while we see a sharpening repression at home, we see autocrats are embarking on a sophisticated effort to corrupt and destabilize democracies while actively seeking to prevent democracy from taking hold elsewhere. It's by pursuing their own interests through their own ways of doing business 
but they are eroding democracy around the world. And their compulsion to undermine free societies provides confirmation of the power and allure of democratic ideals. Democracy isn't perfect by any means. It's actually a pathway for us to make our own mistakes, figure out how to deal with them. But the sheer numbers of those fighting for freedom are fleeing authoritarian regimes around the world. It tells us that people everywhere instinctively understand that their lives are happier, safer, and more prosperous in a free society, something that is backed up by data. And as long as democracy persists, authoritarians never, never feel entirely secure because they know that despite their rhetoric appropriating democracy and human rights, they don't govern with the consent of their people. Beijing spends billions of dollars on anti-democratic activities because it understands that corroding democracy in the rest of the world ultimately becomes the best way to protect the Communist Party's monopoly on power in China. And Russia works to challenge democratic uprisings beyond its borders to reduce the prospect of homegrown challenges. These dictators view democracy not just as a competitive system of governance, but at times as an existential threat to themselves. So I am, by nature, an optimist. But at the start of 2022, my first full year as Ned's president and CEO, there wasn't a lot to cheer about. The autocrats were playing offense, and momentum seemed to be on their side. Xi had become the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao, cementing his authority by jailing opponents, turning Hong Kong into a police state, persecuting Tibetans, and waging genocide on the Uyghurs with impunity. Beijing announced a no-limits partnership with Moscow as Russian troops rolled across the border into Ukraine. In Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini ruled with an iron fist, expanding Iran's influence in Iraq and Syria, sending weapons to Hezbollah and the Houthis. And with the world focused on the COVID-19 crisis, you saw the Taliban consolidate control in Afghanistan, Daniel Ortega imprison his political opponents in Nicaragua, and the military derail the democratic transition in Sudan. But none of this happened just by accident or because people stopped wanting to live in freedom. On the contrary, a 2021 study found that the number of protest movements around the world more than tripled in 15 years. These repressive activities may have taken place in widely dispersed locations, but somehow they were all connected. There is part of a, of a campaign, part of a network of authoritarian states with China and Russia in, at the vanguard. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and NED board member, Ann Applebaum, she's coined the term Autocracy Inc. to describe the sophisticated web of bad, bad actors whose tentacles reach every corner of the world, bringing repression, violence, terror, and misery. Throughout the world, the demand for democracy has never been stronger, but so too is the autocrats' determination to defeat it. With strategies straight out of a corporate playbook, authoritarians form joint ventures with other like-minded autocrats to share ideas, resources, technologies. Working in close collaboration, they've widened their spheres of influence through media and marketing campaigns that spread disinformation and divisiveness and their corrupt deals erode the rule of law and accountable institutions while capturing elites wherever they engage. With a ruthlessness that would be the envy of any self-respecting mafioso, they use money and weapons to gain control of leaders who are willing to sell their own countries to hold on to power and, to, and their stol stolen wealth. So one recent example is the Central African Republic, whose authoritarian president has turned his nation into a Russian puppet state in return for Moscow sending mercenaries to prop up his regime. Not only has the CAR ceded control of valuable timber and mining interests to the Kremlin, but it's agreed to Russia's demand that it abolish presidential terms, term limits, and even adopt Bitcoin as a national currency. And this makes it easier for revenue from diamonds and gold to flow to Moscow to finance the war in Ukraine without the hassle of scrutiny or sanctions. Best practices of the worst regimes is one way to think about this. So unfortunately, they've proven to be effective. Beginning around 20, 2006, a remarkable 30-year period of democratic expansion came to a halt. 
Much of it had to do with problems in established democracies, including our own. More recently, this new authoritarian resurgence we've seen has accelerated the worldwide democratic recession that continues to this day. When I was born in the 1970s, there were fewer than 30 democracies in the world, and by the time I got to college, the number had risen to nearly 80. Western democracies saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union as the inevitable triumph of democracy over communism. With the Cold War over, freedom could flourish. Like many, I was intoxicated with the sense of opportunity, of possibility in this brave and free new world. It wasn't all good news, of course. The, there was the Tiananmen Square massacre, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, bloody wars in the Balkans, the genocide in Rwanda. These are experiences that, that shaped my own career. But burgeoning democratic openings made these tragic events the exceptions, and democracy seemed ascendant. The United States was the only remaining superpower and guarantor of global order. We couldn't imagine democracy being on the defensive. We were wrong. In the wake of the Cold War, democracies thought deep engagement with Russia and China would encourage political reform. I was part of that effort. We welcomed them into the international system, hoping they'd develop into reasonable stakeholders. But we saw as Putin and Xi became ever more autocratic at home, they turned their back on this prospect and over time became, began to exploit democracy's openness to weaken it from within. The commitment of democracies to open exchange of ideas renders them particularly vulnerable to forms of influence that are known as sharp power, a concept that's introduced by Chris Walker, the NED's Vice President for Studies and Analysis. So hard power uses force to achieve an outcome. Soft power relies on persuasion. Sharp power is when an authoritarian state seeks to undermine democracy in other countries by capturing elites, by sowing chaos, stoking polarization, by spreading disinformation. And it's an approach that can work almost anywhere, but it's particularly effective where democracy is just taking root or hasn't yet delivered all the benefits people were expecting. And the autocrats understood that in the digital age, keeping their own people in check wasn't going to be enough. To maintain their hold on power, they would form a new network of like-minded regimes that worked in close coordination to undermine democracy throughout the world. Now, history is littered with dictators and despots that are working together to maintain their own power. More than 200 years ago, the monarchs of Austria, Prussia, and Russia joined forces to fight revolutionary France. But what, what makes this current cabal more effective and dangerous is the sheer scale and scope of their activities and ambitions turbocharged by technology today. So when people first hear about Autocracy Inc., they're sometimes skeptical. Can there really be this global conspiracy to bring down democracy? Does it work that way? And it sounds like something from a James Bond movie, as Anne Applebaum likes to say. It's not quite that. But allow me to offer some ex examples to help make it real. So China's approach is the most wide-ranging. And it includes reshaping global governance through major institutions like the United Nations. So with the support of other autocratic governments, Chinese citizens now lead four of the 15 principal UN agencies and hold deputy spots in nine. And China's played a decisive role in removing civil society that's critical of human rights records from UN proceedings. And its no vote has shielded many of its fellow autocrats from criticism in these fora. China isn't alone in its efforts to bend global institutions to its will. Russia and other, critic, other regimes have illegally used Interpol, the world's leading police cooperation body, to track down their exiled political opponents. Understanding the power of media, China and Russia have been providing countries in Africa and Latin America with news and programming favorable to their interests for years, and the investment's paying off. Case in point, when the Kremlin's messaging about its invasion of Ukraine has gotten zero traction in, in the West. It's gained credence among people in the global South. But this isn't just about providing alternative perspective on information. The approach is more sophisticated. Throughout Africa, for example, Beijing has mounted a concerted effort to reshape the media ecosystem. Chinese companies now produce 50% of the smartphones in Africa, which come preloaded with news apps that provide only sanitized news favorable to Beijing. It's building a monopoly of providing satellite coverage to rural communities across the continent. 
And thanks to Chinese broadcasters, Russia Today is back on the air across Africa. Beijing's also invested in digital and physical media infrastructure, whether it's buying the only printing press, presses in one East African country, the leading news agency on the continent, 60% of the leading newspaper in a Southern African country. China's hosting up to 400 journalists a year across the continent on exchanges as it works to co-opt editors and writers, negotiates content production agreements with African media outlets, and resorts to direct payments to scholars to publish op-eds that are written in Beijing. So we don't need balloons to tell us that China is conducting surveillance on a global scale. Using big data and biometric and facial recognition, the government's built a sophisticated system to keep tabs on its citizens at home, and now offering that technology to over 80 governments across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Europe, making repression easier and more affordable than ever. This technology push has brought one silver lining. It's catalyzed the development of innovative tools to help democracy advocates working on the front lines with new strategies for ensuring their digital and physical security and circumventing efforts to block the internet or control information. When it comes to old school transnational aggression, Russia and Iran are still leaders of the pack. In classic autocracy Inc. style, Putin gave Belarus's dictator, Alexander Lukashenko, a 1.5 billion loan and weapons to use against anti-government protesters before the crisis in Ukraine began. And it came along with expert coaching on how, police coaching on how to crack down on demonstrations, as well as media presenters to shape the narrative. Russia's deployed the Wagner Group, its violent band of, of mercenaries, to prop up human rights abusers in countries like Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Mali. Meanwhile, Iran is now supplying Russia with drones and weapons for its war in Ukraine, and Putin shows appreciation by helping Tehran suppress dissidents among its people. Even impoverished North Korea and embattled Burma are demonstrating their fealty to Moscow with artillery shipments. And in the Gulf states, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have undermined democratic voices from Bahrain to Tunisia and Sudan. All engage in transnational repression going after their perceived opponents within our free societies. New Yorkers know this well from the FBI's investigation into a Chinese police outpost here in Manhattan as part of a global network of more than 100 such outposts documented by human rights groups. So as we consider the global ambitions of these autocrats, we can't lose sight of their impact on real people. Last December, when I was in Berlin, I met Gulbahar Yalalova, who testified at the Uyghur Tribunal, a UK organization that's investigating China's persecution of Uyghur and other Turkic Muslim populations. And her story is the stuff of dystopian nightmares. A citizen of Kazakhstan, she was on a business trip to Urumqi, China in 2017, when she was awakened by police in her hotel room, arrested and taken to prison under false charges of terrorism. She was stripped of her clothes, her name, and her national identity. Her Kazakh passport was replaced with a Chinese ID card, which designated her as a Uyghur from Xinjiang. And over the next 15 months, she, along with hundreds of other women, as young as 14, as old as 80, were systematically beaten, starved, even tortured. Punishments that the Chinese Communist Party deems appropriate for such alleged crimes as listening to forbidden songs, using WhatsApp, visiting another country, some of her colleagues had their fingernails removed. Others died from complications from forced abortions or sterilizations. Gang rape was a regular practice in some interrogations. It took more than a year for Gulbahar's family to find her and secure her release. Others have not been so lucky. She was grateful to have survived, but physically and mentally broken in ways that will never mend. And she's haunted by the memory of the women and girls who remain detained, who have no one to save them. And since the crackdown on Uyghurs began in 2014, over one million have been detained in so-called vocational education and training centers, internment camps, in what is the largest detention of ethnic minorities since World War II. More than 16,000 mosques have been destroyed as part of a broader suppression of religious practices. Hundreds of thousands of children were forcibly separated from their parents to be raised as loyal Chinese. 
The result is that birth rates in the region fell by 60% over three years. The US government and others have now designated the Chinese actions as genocide. Tibetans have been subject, subjected to comparable practices. Approximately one million Tibetan children have been separated from their families, placed in state-run boarding schools as part of an effort to erase their language, religion, culture, identity. So Gubelhar's story reminds us that the fight for democracy and human rights is, is, isn't just an intellectual debate about which form of government is better, superior, public policies. It's about ordinary people who want to live in freedom without fear of arrest or persecution in a society where they can debate and disagree on major policy ideas. It's about regimes who understand that the only way to make the world safe for autocracy and kleptocracy is to use technology and repression to control their people, to reshape international norms, to render international institutions impotent, to manipulate information and ecosystems, in effect, to make the world dangerous for democracy and freedom. It's about Gulbahar and all of those who at this moment are living a horror story that for many of us is just almost beyond comprehension. So no, there wasn't much to cheer about at the start of 2022. But by the start of this year, a shift was palpable. Because of their own mistakes, the autocrats were on the defensive as citizens rose up demanding respect and freedom. Ukrainians stopped and then began to push back Russia's invading forces. Tens of thousands of Russians summoned the courage to protest the war, knowing that they faced arrest, with 20,000 now in detention. Another million fled their own country to avoid being called up to fight a war they don't believe in, no matter what Putin says. A deadly fire that killed Uyghurs that were trapped in their apartments because of China's zero COVID policies unleashed the largest wave of civic unrest across China in decades. It became known as the White Paper Revolution, leading Xi to reverse course on the pandemic. And on the eve of what should have been Xi's triumphant 20th Party Congress, Peng Lifa, better known as the Sitong Bridge Man, unfurled banners that went viral before censors could act. And they read, we want food, not COVID tests. We want reform, not cultural revolution. We want freedom, not lockdowns, elections, not rulers. We want dignity, not lies, be citizens, not slaves. In Iran, the death of Masa Amini, resulting from a simple headscarf violation, sparked protests throughout the country among every, age or every major ethnic group. Started by women, men from all walks of life quickly join in, tired of seeing their wives and mothers, their daughters and sisters harassed by authorities. In Sudan, Civilian resistance committees mobilized massive demonstrations, forcing the military to begin negotiating a return to a democratically elected civilian-controlled government. In Burma, pro-democracy activists across ethnic communities forged an opposition national unity government and worked together to immobilize the country through silent strikes and civil resistance against the military junta. So is the pendulum swinging the other way? Are the autocrats being confronted with the consequences of their bad decisions and overreach? In an article published just before her death last year, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright wrote about a period during the Cold War when many thought Soviet-style governments would last forever because of their willingness to quash dissent before it could take hold. Then the Iron Curtain lifted and the Berlin Wall fell, taking the theory of totalitarian permanence with it. Democracy, Secretary Albright argued, is not a dying cause, but is poised for a comeback, in part because the world's two most prominent authoritarian states, she writes, China and Russia, have squandered their best chance of offering an alternative, appealing alternative to liberal democracy. Putin, Xi, and Khamenei may or may not be nearing their own Berlin Wall at the moment anytime soon. But the fall of the wall and the relentless courage of ordinary people Despite even harsher repression, it reminds them, it reminds us, that the demand for democracy remains strong. And under the right circumstances, even the most repressive and seemingly secure regimes can crumble. So as Putin orders half a million Russian civilians into involuntary military service, the war in Ukraine can no longer be ignored by ordinary people whose sons are being sent into battle as cannon fodder. 
More, failure on the, more failures on the battlefield could fuel a Game of Thrones in the Kremlin among elites already rattled by a sharp upswing in the mysterious deaths of prominent officials and business leaders. There's no way to predict when a democratic breakthrough might occur, and it's not our role to do so. Democratic movements are dramatically more effective and sustainable when they are homegrown and nonviolent. The future of any nation must rest in the hands of its own people. That's the essence of democracy. But as we saw during the fall of the Iron Curtain and the, during the Arab Spring, when a regime falls in one country, there can be a domino effect. And unlike open societies, with built-in shock absorbers providing outlets for people's frustrations, repressive societies seem stable, while in truth, they're brittle. So these are indeed challenging times for those of us who believe so passionately in democracy. I remain optimistic. More democratic states may be under threat. We may have profound challenges within our own democracy and other established democracies. But most people in most countries prefer the dignity that comes with freedom. And many are willing to risk everything in its pursuit. I'm not naive. The environment remains hostile. The autocrats are playing their long game. So must we. History may yet be on democracy's side, but an era of repression, polarization, rising illiberalism across the world, reversing the tide will depend on good defense and an even better offense. There, of course, is no equivalency between the open, nonviolent tactics of democracy movements and the repressive, corrupt, and violent techniques of autocrats. Nonetheless, there are lessons worth learning from the autocrats' playbook, starting with Democrats working together in solidarity. To defeat Autocracy, Inc., we need Democracy United, a focused and coordinated counter-mobilization against sharp power globally. As Journal of Democracy co-editors Will Dobson and Tarek Masood write, sharp power can only succeed where people are indifferent to democracy's survival, incapable of recognizing it when it's under threat, or unwilling to act in concert to resist that threat. Most urgently, most urgently, that means democracies must help Ukrainians defeat Russia and preserve their freedom. The free world must also work together to help Taiwan safeguard its democracy. To lose either to authoritarian invasion would be a catastrophic blow to the cause of global freedom. Equally, a strategy of solidarity means we must stand with the growing number of democracy advocates forced to flee their homeland to escape persecution, violence, and imprisonment, whether Venezuelan, Russian, or Afghan. Lesson number two, take a systematic approach to fostering innovation. We've got to learn, innovate, and raise our game. Authoritarians tend to surround themselves with sycophants and yes-men, as in Russia, where no one was brave enough to tell Putin his army really wasn't equipped to conquer Ukraine. Progress and innovation require learning from trial and error, an impossible task when mistakes are not allowed. So at the endowment, we're aiming to help our partners outpace and outflank the autocrats by investing in democratic networks in which they can share new ideas and best practices across movements and regions. This includes cutting edge approaches to fighting disinformation, protecting the integrity of the information space, tackling transnational kleptocracy, and fostering democratic unity to counter authoritarian influence. We're accelerating and sharpening efforts to ensure that democratic activists have access to the latest tools so that they're able to work more safely and effectively. And through our grant making, we're supporting effort, efforts by civic actors to gain a seat at the table to shape new digital and technological norms and to bring transparency to decision making shaping the future. Lesson number three, be prepared to take advantage of opportunities. With the support of Congress, NET is investing significant resources to support opportunities for democratic organizing in the lead up to elections, whether or not they are likely to be free or fair. And this year alone, democratic actors are working to expand their room for maneuver ahead of elections in Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Thailand, Turkey, Poland, Bangladesh. And we're responding to events and meeting, meeting demand from partners as Iranians suddenly mobilized in protest, or as Sudanese, Tunisians, and Peruvians organized to restore their path to democracy. 
Lesson four, provide moral and material support for those who are bravely fighting the good fight on the home turf. Russia's future will be determined by Russians. China's by Chinese, Cubans by Cuba, Cuban, Cuba's by Cubans, and so on. That we, as members of a broader international community, we don't have to remain passive, just watching activists and citizens when they're arrested, mistreated, killed, in their quest for human rights or basic freedoms. When they seek it, we should give them support. This means supporting the work of human rights defenders and grassroots civic groups of those working to overcome efforts to block access to independent information, of those pushing for accountability and transparency in governance, and of those working to document abuses and advocate for persecuted communities. This past December at Ned's own Lipset lecture, Anne Applebaum described in detail the many ways in which autocrats were subverting global freedom globally. And during the Q&A, she was asked if she remained optimistic. And here's what she said. Pessimism is irresponsible. You have to be an optimist. There's no law of history, no rule that says we are declining. What happens next depends on what we do. It's the optimists, it's the people who do things, the people who want to create and change things that make a difference, she said. So it's those people, the struggle people, who we at NED are proud to support. My friend, the pro-democracy activist Vladimir Karamurza, who despite being imprisoned in Russia right now, remains an incorrigible optimist. We had lunch in April last year, just hours before he was scheduled to fly back to Moscow. And I said to him, Vladimir, you know they're going to arrest you. Why are you going back to Russia? And he replied with a story about Natalia Gorbanevskaya, one of just seven demonstrators who went to Red Square in 1968 to protest the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. She knew she'd be arrested and would likely go to prison, but she protested anyways in her words, because in her words, it meant the authorities could never claim, again claim that everyone in the Soviet Union approved of the invasion. The Czechs took notice. A Prague newspaper wrote, we now have at least seven reasons for which we will never be able to hate the Russian people. So as Vladimir put it, even if we accept a dictator's false narrative that the majority of people is on board with them, every voice in opposition is precious. Even seven people can sometimes save the honor of an entire nation, let alone the thousands of Russians arrested for protesting Putin's war on Ukraine since it began. Despite everything that's happening today, Vladimir told me, I am certain a more hopeful time will come and we will begin the important work of building a democratic Russia and integrating it into the civilized world. And this time, we'd better get it right. So ladies and gentlemen, the struggle for freedom, it persists everywhere in the world regardless. It's the yearning of the spirit of the human soul that drives people to do this work. We owe it to the courageous men and women who are fighting for freedom to redouble our efforts to forge a path to support them in liberty and justice for all. It won't be easy. But I do believe that ordinary people doing simple, extraordinary things around the world, they will write democracy's next chapter. I want to thank you for your time and attention this evening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, all right. I see there's some microphones, please. Thank you, sir. Maybe I'll uh, take you, you, sir, and I think there's a woman in the back as well. We'll take two at a time. Okay, please. Oh, the mic? Yes. Okay. My, my name is Wilson, and uh, I'm originally from Ethiopia. And uh, I came here 20 years ago as an asylum because of the political persecution that I faced. And my brother was um, a lawyer here, but he was also a constitutional lawyer, worked with your uh, endowment in Ethiopia about 30 years ago to bring you know, democracy and everything. But that didn't work. In 1996, 97, we were all reading Francis Fukuyama's book that uh, democracy, liberal democracy is gonna be you know, universal. Uh, now the Chinese, with their Road and Belt uh, initiative, are giving money to a lot of African nations. They are indebting all these nations, small poor nations, and uh, they are allowing autocrats to do whatever they want to do because with the United States there's also uh, 
you know, some kind of check and balances. Uh, the Communist Party makes all the decision. The private industry in China, you know, follows the, the Chinese government. In the United States, private investment is, you know, decentralized and Congress is divided. So th there's no way of countering Chinese investment unless there's some kind of movement. Uh, question. Yes. So in Ethiopia, uh, there is a lot of killing and murder right now. And what are you doing about it? And two, the climate change is going to bring a lot of war and conflict with the nations. What do you think could be the solution for that? Was there a question in the back as well? I can take two at a time if that makes sense. Uh, no. This gentleman here. I'll take both of these, okay. please. Thank you. Um, I, it's, I have more of a comment is, is name, uh, than a question. What's your name, sir? Uh, Dennis Chang. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I, I wish to address the, the issue of the uh, repression of the uh, Uyghurs, but especially, well, just Muslims in, in China. And, you know, we are led to believe by a lot of this rhetoric, especially with the use of the word genocide, that uh, there's this complete op oppression of these minority groups, especially Muslims. And I can only tell you, I lived in China from 2004 to 2006. I was employed by an American university, Fort Hayes State University, to lecture in the subjects of anthropology, American history, and European history at a university in northeastern China. And I made it a point uh, to travel around as much as I could to see how much real oppression is being practiced by the Chinese government and how much freedom there actually is. And I was surprised almost to the point of being shocked at how much freedom I saw of especially, uh, well, first, the, the, the size of the Muslim minority, it's not just in Xinjiang province. Right. I spent a month traveling around Xinjiang province, especially uh, observing the treatment of Uyghurs in that region. But I also saw very large communities of Muslims in northeastern China, which is where I was actually, right. the university I was teaching at, that was where I was based, and in Inner Mongolia. And uh, I, as I said, I was, I can only speak to what I saw at a mass on the grassroots level about it. the society at large. And I can say that there, there was no oppression that I could see of, of uh, the practice of the Muslim religion. Got it. I'll, I'll respond, Dennis. I got a comment, not a question, but I'll still respond to that if I might, Dennis. So, first of all, Wilson, let me just say, I mean, I didn't address it in my marks, remarks, but one of the most horrific humanitarian catastrophes has been playing out in Ethiopia, and there are hundreds of thousands that have been killed in the fighting that's uh, afflicted Ethiopia, and so my, my heart goes out to uh, um, many of your compatriots. Um, I'm sorry? I know. Yes, I know. I know. So um, I guess a couple of things. Um, you had a couple points built into there. Let me just underscore the humility. We're an independent foundation based in Washington. It's not, we don't sit in Washington at NED, take guidance from the US government, or even at NED and say, what do we do to Ethiopia? It's not how we approach. Our approach, in fact, I have Ethiopians on my staff, like we have folks, we, we take proposals in 55 languages, we have 55 languages on staff. Anybody can come in at any language. Our, our staff is often from these countries, from these regions. And it really is to respond to demand. What is Ethiopian civil society, independent media journalists, what are, what are they trying to do? What are their ideas? What do they want to do? And do we have the honor to provide some modest support? Because ultimately, we believe in being long-term consistent Oftentimes, US policy, other countries' policies change. So you can have big zigzags. The endowment has the beauty of just having a consistent mission to support democracy. And so we believe in that consistency of long-term presence and support. I've just come back from Nigeria, 
And the partners that we were supporting during the military junta in Nigeria played a major role in the transition from Nigeria, from military, a peaceful transition from military to democracy. They remain icons and sort of um, uh, very powerful voices of conscience in Nigerian society today. That long-term support Small groups that we invested in 20 years ago are now helping to run nationwide 225 million voter parallel vote counts. It's a long time consistency to support the ideas, the indigenous, the work of local partners, their struggle, their approach, their ideas. And so we don't take on the role of how do we fix Ethiopia? It's just not the mindset. I think we need to support Ethiopians to, and, and their struggle. Um, and so it is with humility that we come to this work because you've seen from US policy or others, you know, trying to remake other, like that, that's not the thinking. That's not how I think about sustainable change. Now, you mentioned um, Frank Fukuyama, who was very active uh, at Stanford, was part of the endowment family once on our board. And in many respects, right, um, the end of history, democracy's triumph. But on the other hand, what we've seen is some of Frank's argument has been right. As you see other autocratic regimes, particularly the, the Chinese Communist Party, appropriate the terminology to try to redefine what democracy means, to use international institutions to reshape how we think and apply human rights. And so in some respects, they're not resisting the word democracy or human rights. They're trying to redefine in a way that protects abuses or protects autocrats. It's actually slightly more insidious, but it does point to Frank's point that in some respects there's an exceeding the existential argument that legitimacy is grounded in people. Um, Dennis, your point, and I, you know, I, I, you of course have had your experiences, I respect that. Um, all I can do is to refer you to a very deep body of research that is first led by the Uyghur community the documents from beginning in 2014, so many years after you were there, um, uh, a significant crackdown on the Uyghur communities that were in East Turkestan, primarily um, in East Turkestan. 2017, the opening of an internment set camps that have led, and I, I, it's not even, I, I don't consider it rhetoric, I'm citing sort of the work, the research, first of the Uyghur community, of many others that have backed this up about what has happened to that community. I think you're also referring to the we Muslim population. And there are now new reports out about how the situation has begun to change for other Muslims across, across China as well. Many of our Chinese partners have pointed to a consolidating of power under Xi Jinping. And they felt a very different environment under previous, uh, under previous leaders. We have seen a tightening of authority, a control, the, the most dominant Chinese leader since Mao in a way that has shifted and changed the approach to surveillance control of people at home. So that's what I can offer from the research, from the evidence that we see from our partners, but I respect your own experiences there. All right. If you, uh, there it is. All right, from George. Is it always necessary for a country's military to explicitly collaborate in the fall of a democracy? Um, um, you know, it's, there are a couple ways. Um, you've seen different approaches. You've seen different things happen historically and the, the role that military has played. Part of what goes into a lot of strengthening of democratic institutions is how to develop a culture of civilian control of the military. And that is, uh, that, is, that is a difficult concept in many places. So you have seen in many, many circumstances where often military is part of a societal pushback because of how ordinary soldiers are treated. Um, whether disrespect for their regard, for their life, lack of even food supplies. You've seen this historically in Russia um, uh, uh, as well. Um, you've also seen in many efforts in, where societies have changed to build relationships of trust and confidence between those who might be civic activists and those in the military who want to uh, 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 navigate a way forward. 
Sudan is a really good example of a negotiated path forward and a return to democracy in which citizens groups, political actors, because of protests on the street, forcing talks around a table, negotiating with the military, came to an agreed set of terms for restoration of democracy in Sudan. You saw this fall apart after about 12 months, and you saw the mobilization of the population again, that yet again brought the military back to the negotiating table to try to work out a negotiated way forward. And so you see this play out in many, many different ways. Um, I don't think there's a, a cookie cutter approach, but those who are democracy advocates understand that it's in their interest to build coalitions and invite people to be part of part of what they're doing to reflect the benefit of all society. And so you do see very some you see at times very unusual unusual circumstances. Um, I worked in the White House at a time where. Um, it was not clear in the Orange Revolution whether pre then President Yanukovych would call the Ukrainian military out to, to fire on Ukrainian protesters. Um, uh, uh, actually, it was candidate Yanukovych at the time. He was later president under the Revolution of Dignity. And it was really interesting because this was a post Soviet military with lots of history. And yet, we had been working to build confidence and relationships between US military, Ukrainian military. Um, and it was a jump ball. Folks weren't quite clear. And there were some, some democratic actors really pushing the military not to intervene while being leaned on by others that wanted a crackdown. And ultimately, you saw the military step back and say, this is not, we don't do this. And it led to pretty significant, pretty significant change. Um, so it is, I think, a really important factor to think about not black and white circumstances, but how our alliance is possible in, in particularly dangerous situations. The truth is, is that the research is very compelling. When civil civic movements, when democracy movements turn violent, they're much more likely to fail. And if they do succeed, the likelihood that that country remains a democracy within, the, within 10 years is quite substantially diminished. When you see a nonviolent negotiated action uh, that we've seen from solidarity in Poland, the civil resistance in India, hopefully what we see plays out in Sudan. When you see a nonviolent violent transition, it almost doubles the percentage of success that 10 years later that country remains a democracy. And so I think that's a really compelling part. Martin Luther King had it right. Gandhi had it right. The power of peaceful, nonviolent civil resistance it's not just a smart way to protect human dignity and human life. It's an effective way to help deliver, deliver more durable democratic institutions that will protect future generation rights. So that interface between uh, security and protest is, is significant. Great. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. What are the NAED's involvement in Central and South America, and what are the trends that you're seeing there? Yes. And then I think there was a question in the back as well. I think in the very back. These two. Hello, I'm from the World Liberty Congress, a grantee of National Endowment of Democracy. Thank yes. you so much for all that you what's, do. What's your name, sir? Uh, Faisal Saeed al Motar, original from Iraq, so I'm the Middle East coordinator. Uh, so I have actually two questions. One about, uh, I mean, I've been spoken roughly around 40 states around the United States, in universities, etc. And I would say there's a lot of rise of anti-Western sentiment among students, among a new generation uh, within the US. Many times I hear the question, oh, well, uh, as bad as, oh, you're from Iraq, we're as bad as Iraq, we're as bad as Iran. So what do you think can be done, especially what's your advice to the new generation that is facing a lot of this kind of anti-Western sentiment? Uh, question number two is, do you think China is winning? Uh, I just came back from the Middle East. I was in Africa for a, and I see like Huawei is all over the place. Surveillance technology is being sold to even Middle Eastern countries. I think Egypt just bought a very heavy surveillance technology, which means everybody gonna be tracked within the next 10 years. Um, so do you think that democracy has a future in countries where China is actually selling its technology and dominating? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for what you do, by the way. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you. Um, first question on, on Central and South America. Latin America is an important. The endowment has a, um, when President Reagan, uh, the endowment grew out of a push from the left under Jimmy Carter, human rights activist, to be focused in labor's involvement. The first time any American civic society supported others was labor unions supporting solidarity. 
And then on the right, President Reagan and the era of standing up to Soviet communism, thank you so much. Um, these forces came together, um, and President Reagan, when he launched the idea that Congress acted on was how to support the, a global infrastructure. So we do have a global mindset, a global footprint, and so Latin America is a pretty prominent part uh, of our portfolio. And what we've really seen is a real, much more sharpening and difficult approach, particularly in Central America. Um, one of the things that we saw in recent years was first an in deeply, deeply sharpening of repression in, in Nicaragua, in which Daniel Ortega's return to the surprise of all the Nicaraguans that we talked to, he basically imprisoned every single one of the candidates running for president against him. They, you know, at least people, you know, they knew they weren't going to have a free fight at the election. They didn't all expect to end up in jail. It was a very brutal repression. Uh, today, some of those political prisoners were released and flown to the United States after some negotiations, thank goodness. But um, what we saw is uh, backsliding, particularly in Central America, um, as copycat laws were copy, you know, a law passed in Nicaragua that was about restricting foreign financing or using terrorism means to crack down on civil society, um, really duplicated itself. We've seen an evisceration of the independent judiciary in Guatemala because the judiciary was trying to expose corruption, and now many of those judges have had to flee to the United States. We've seen populist president in El Salvador, a young media savvy president, um, play in skirts with civic liberties, use populism, battling deals with the gangs, battling the gangs in a way that has, has uh, undermined many of the democratic institutions that are there. Um, and, and so the way I see it, the people that the endowment supports are um, independent, you know, two women in Honduras doing investigative uh, journalism, small community, grassroots groups that I see as really sustainable ways to how to build the building blocks of a, of a healthier society, which they will have to grow and support over time. But it's been a particularly tough time in, in, in Central America, Costa Rica, Panama, notwithstanding, separate sense. Across Latin America, um, you just look at what happened in Bolivia or in Peru, difficulties in failed transitions, and it's wrapped up between both democratic, non-democratic, but also indigenous and, and non-indigenous. It's a more complex mix as we're seeing playing out in Peru and Bolivia. Um, and so it is a tumultuous, tumultuous time in Latin America. One of the things I didn't unpack here is that one of the most significant developments in the past, within the last decade, is that China has overtaken the international financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, um, uh, and certainly the United States is the most important debtor uh, uh, financial asset control uh, in the region. And I think this will have knock-on consequences for democracy. Every investigative journalist that uncovered corruption in Ecuador, which ultimately led to the president's imprisonment, each one of those investigations traced to a Chinese company. Um, and, and the investigative journalists, they knew Ecuador, they didn't understand China. They don't understand yet what it means for their societies, and we're seeing that um, with a, at a heavy price. Faisal is worth something that I'm talking about, the World Liberty Congress. The World Liberty Congress is this idea, it's not us, it's you. It's people like Faisal, it's activists from around the world who believe in their country having a better future, coming together across countries, across uh, uh, around the world to learn, share tech, tech tactics, figure out how can you learn more rapidly together. So we're interested in seeing what you do, how you advance that, that learning. Faisal, I think a lot are, are counting on it. Um, and you said you've seen, we had some protesters here earlier today, people that are skeptical. You, you talk about young generation. Um, and look, I get it. I get it. If you grow up in the United States, not when I did, you were born after me, you saw Iraq, Afghanistan. You saw a Wall Street disaster lead to Main Street crisis economically. I'm from South Carolina. I see what rural communities look like there in the Midwest, globalization, what that means for jobs. This, there's a, and you see populism, disinformation, polarization in our environment. Technology today, the information environment, kleptocratic networks, everything I talked about that autocrats use are actually elements in free societies. And so 
Am I concerned about that? I am. But the difference if you're sitting in an in a autocratic society is you can't talk about it. If you're sitting in this country, if you're sitting in a free society, you can get angry, you can organize, you can protest, you can vote, you can hold people accountable, you can make institutions work, you can do investigative reports. We, democracy isn't the answer. Democracy gives citizens the pathway to achieve their aspirations, but you have to work at it. I do like to also, and I talk about this a lot with our own staff, because like, we're like, oh my God, we're the National Dem, we're supporting all these folks, how do we do this when the United States is a mess? And if you think about it, we got things to work through in our country. I come from South Carolina, my congressman is Jim Clyburn, a black man in South Carolina. He has perspective on understanding that Americans' democracy has not always been what people might want to project. And he says in town hall meetings in South Carolina, he says, look, he quotes de Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville and his southern accent, I love it. Um, America isn't the greatest country because it's the most, America's greatness isn't because it's the most enlightened country, but it's a country that more than most other, has a means, a way to repair its faults. And if you think about that, you think about our history. I mean, a commander in chief, George Washington, any other personality, that would not have come out the right way. The second president of the United States, John Adams, he passed the Alien and Sedition Act and threw every journalist that wrote critical things about him in jail. You think about the run-up to what happened to our Civil War. You think about a Civil War that we fought with not one Confederate military leader or political leader imprisoned or held accountable after the war. You think about the freedmen rights that came out of the war being rolled back immediately. You think about our election of 1877, in which the, the loser negotiated a deal to become President Hayes in exchange for ending Reconstruction, opening up the introduction of Jim Crow laws, leading to decades of repression, leading to civil rights movements in the 50s. Do I need to go on? <laughs> so work at it, get angry, organize, mobilize. And that's all we're trying to do. Everybody deserves the right in their societies to make mistakes and then figure it out for themselves. And that's what democracy is. Democracy isn't the answer. Democracy gives an opportunity to try to figure out the answer. We are struggling with inequality today. We are not getting it right. But can we research it? Can we document it? Can we scream about it? Can we publish about it? Can we go protest on our members of Congress? Can we? That's what happens. That's, what, that's how change happens. That's why autocrats are often brittle, because they can't open up the space for debate in society about the tough issues that we have to grapple with. And that's ultimately why democracy is a self-repairing way. But it doesn't, fit, it doesn't work if those disenchanted young people stay home, just get frustrated. They're gonna, it's going to be darker if they turn that energy into how to change things, how to achieve, how to act on their, how to convince others, how to build coalitions, how to actually translate it into policy. That's how we get stronger. And so is China winning? Right now, I tried to explain, I think democracy and freedom are under challenge around the world in very serious ways. I'm very concerned about it. I am confident over the long term because what happens? We're slow, we wake up to things slowly, but as we grapple and begin to understand with the challenge, the nature of things we're dealing with, we tend to mobilize, we tend to figure it out, we tend to work together. It's about ingenuity, innovation, it's about, and so we better be concerned, we better be working hard, um, but ultimately what makes it really powerful is it's not about we, Americans, it's not ours to answer. It is about helping those countries around the world so that they are not just objects and subjects as they may once have been of imperial colonialist policies, but that they have agency, that their people are able to help determine their own pathways. And that gives me confidence that those who are being subjected to many of these practices today, um, that ultimately what drives people internally are so frustrated if they don't have that sense of dignity and freedom. It pushes people. And that, I think, is an irrepressible force. 
So I think we've probably uh, uh, probably exhausted it if I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.